cold and stormy night deep in the woodland of Northumberland, a disheveled man is currently running for his life. The tumultuous sound of his pursuers over the torrential rain as he shudders from each recurring breath. His crimes and his name are unknown, but with each pounding step he slowly begins to defile the soil and corrupt the land. The people of Alnwick are blissfully unaware of the grotesque monstrosity that will soon be upon them and cast their sleepy little village into utter bleakness. After countless miles of being on the run, leaving his past beyond the pines and his body pushed to its limits, he finally catches a glimpse of his destination cutting through the trees, his true bastion of safety, Alnwick Castle. Making his way to the port Cullis, he pleads to the guards to be let through, his pursuers getting ever closer with each passing second. Thankfully, however, the Lord, Yusis Deveshi, just so happens to be a close friend of the stranger and tells his garrison to open the gate and get the man to safety. With blissful ignorance, the Lord has just condemned the residents of his vast estate to a horrifying plague. This is the story of the Alnwick Vampire. After his harrowing escape from the law, the stranger, bruised and beaten, tries his best to wrap his wounds in a small secluded chamber deep within the castle. As he cleans and bandages the many contusions upon his body by candlelight, the sweet coffery smell of blood emanating from his person and the weeping cut staining the wood below, the Lord enters the chamber with a rather tempting proposition. If his friend agrees to become a member of his staff and attend to whatever duties are asked of him around the Grand Estate, whether that be cooking, cleaning or even stabling the horses, the Lord shall give him a warm bed, hot food, but most importantly, a safe haven from his pursuers. Considering his only other option is to step beyond the threshold and take a chance with obeying wolves, but instead of gnashing teeth rushing for his throat it's sharp and still, the stranger happily accepts the gracious offer, and after a few days bed rest, slowly settles into his new life. A few years later in the village market, the hustle and bustle of the peasants echo through the stalls, a reverberation of joyous laughter and intense bartering as each trader promises they have the highest quality goods available and the townsfolk would be foolish to pass up on such bargains. With the smell of fresh food and the tanning of leather, the villagers are on the hunt for produce, livestock and grain to feed their growing families. But one thing that is always given away for free by the traders is of course rumours, as many are hearing the whispers about the man with a shadowy past. In the intervening years, the man has managed to not only find himself a lovely wife, but has also moved out of the small chamber in the castle and into a rather quaint, if not isolated, poverty on the outskirts of the village. His life since arriving in Alnwick has been relatively calm and peaceful, yet when he lays his head down to sleep, his dreams are still nightmare infested with that horrific night, and is near dance with death. With every new start, there are always certain challenges one must face, and the stranger's new life is no different. Since arriving in Alnwick, he hasn't always been given a warm welcome. Some of the residents sneer and even look upon him with intense suspicion for being what they class as an outsider, and due to his suspected previous criminal activity, some even consider him a bad omen for their sleepy little village. The local priest has been one of many to criticise him for not coming to church and living a hedonistic lifestyle. One could argue, after managing to start anew and in turn becoming a much kinder and thoughtful person, a little self-indulgence is the least of the town's concerns. But sadly, that just isn't the case, as the man is ridiculed on a near daily basis. But the tale that is currently being whispered in the tavern isn't entirely about the man himself, but instead, it's about his wife, which if the villagers are to be believed, is having a passionate affair with a local youth. 
Some suggest it's the young and strong son of the local blacksmith, while others hint at it possibly being the butcher's aide. It is not known how long this supposed affair has been going on, but considering that some of the villagers have noticed the young man enter the house of the stranger at late hours, and the fact the woman even married the man to begin with has tainted her already little reputation. As the evening continues, someone approaches the stranger, and most likely a little drunk, dares to mock him to his face. Calling him a godless heathen who cannot satisfy his wife, the rawest laughter quickly comes to an end as he finally has enough of the town's poisonous perception of him, and unleashes a violence of a man akin to such ways. For a second, the villagers feel as if they finally get a glimpse of his past as the snapping of cartilage and breaking of bone reverberates off the tavern walls, and claret covers the floor. After beating the man beyond recognition, he steps outside into the downpour, when the torrential rain attempts to extinguish his still burning rage. The smell of wet mud and sour sweat presenting itself like a foul, unwanted gift. He begins his short journey back home with a wounded hand speckled with blood, a perfect mosaic of sudden violence, and surely the odd broken knuckle. Passing the once busy market, now settling into peaceful serenity, the foot traffic reduced to a single man full of contempt and somewhat wounded pride, he heads down the thoroughfare smelling the strong fragrance of cooking meat and family settling in for the long night. A family. Something he may never get the chance to have if the rumors are true. Finally making it back home, his body tired and weary, his mind racing with paranoia, he wishes to confront his wife as soon as he steps through the door. However, when he steps beyond the threshold, he changes his course of action. If his wife is truly being unfaithful and having this illicit affair, then he'd rather catch her in the act and rain down his wrath upon her and her supposed lover. The next morning, he explains how the Lord is sending him away for a few days and she'll be alone to take care of the house. Grabbing a satchel of provisions and saying goodbye, he leaves Alnwick on foot and heads back into the forest where his story began. Moving deep into the wilderness, the trees surrounding him like gods of a forgotten age, he sets up a small camp and waits until nightfall, the crackling fire reigniting the burning hatred in his heart for the village and all who occupy it. Underneath a cloud-forsaken sky, the only light being the waxing gibbous moon and pinprick of stars, he sneaks back to the house and climbs upon the roof. While laying atop the thatching, slowly slicing a hole so he can observe, he watches as his wife sneaks the youth into the house, and he witnesses as she defiles the bed. Their bed, right before his eyes. As the two lovers embrace, the seething hatred encompassing his very being, his perception clouds. Throwing caution to the wind, he stands up, and before he can react, the roof gives way, and he is sent sprawling below. The weightless seconds seem to last hours. Upon crashing to the floor beside the bed, his body twisted and broken, he curses his wife and swears he'll find a way to punish her. During the commotion and screams of not only anger, but pure agony from the man, the youth escapes the house and flees into the night. Over the next few days and riddled with guilt, his wife attends to his bedside to where he is now bound. Consumed by utter contempt and rage, but his every waking moment filled with a gut-wrenching pain, the man realizes he will never walk again. As the days continue to pass, his body is seized by a great fever brought on by his injuries. The priest is called upon and urges the man to make a confession in order to save his soul. However, finding hypocrisy in the priest's now kind bedside manner, the man merely spits in his face and curses him with his final breath. With a sharp intake of air and seizing of his body, the stranger dies in absolute agony. Deciding the man had gone through enough ridicule and torture, and most likely feeling guilt in his part of the condemnation, the priest, out of good faith, decides to give him a full Christian burial. But it isn't enough to save the village from what is coming.